Hey there, I'm Heather, and today I'm going to be talking a little bit about seismic acquisition methods, um, particularly how they relate to what we would want to do as seismic interpreters. So seismic acquisition has been around for 100 years. We just celebrated the 100th anniversary of kind of the invention of seismic acquisition. Um, the first seismic acquisition survey was actually done in Oklahoma. All right, so let me get started. So with seismic reflection analysis, there's typically three stages. The first stage is acquisition, um, where we collect the raw data using different sources and receivers. The second stage is processing, where we take this data from its raw format and we transform it into something usable. So something that we as seismic interpreters can look at and understand geologically. And then the third stage is interpretation, which is kind of my gig. Um, and this is the main focus of most of my lectures. Uh, and this is where we take the seismic reflection images and we extract geologic meaning from the data. All right, so we're going to start off by understanding how we create and record seismic energy in different environments. So on land, we typically use vibrator trucks as sources and geophones as receivers. Back in the day, we used to use dynamite and that's not really allowed anymore in most places. <laughs> so each environment presents its own unique challenges and opportunities. So often we may have to work around uh, roads or we may have to uh, avoid houses. Last, no, maybe three years ago, I did a seismic acquisition here in Oklahoma and the farmers were in the middle of getting ready to harvest their crops. So we had to <laughs> do the shot points uh, down through a gully system, which was kind of a little bit more difficult terrain. So we have to keep in mind that our land surveys, particularly, we often don't have the freedom to make the exact uh, ideal parameters in terms of acquisition and where we'll put those geophones and where we'll shoot the sh shot points. In marine environments, we often use air guns that release compressed air at very high pressures in order to generate the energy of the seismic waves. So of the seismic energy. Uh, seismic energy. <laughs> so these uh, air guns are typically fired every 10 to 20 seconds or so, and then the reflections are continuously being recorded by hydrophones that are dragged on these long streamers through the ocean. Um, in terms of the source of seismic data, um, there's a lot of different factors that we have to consider. So obviously the first thing is, are we working on land or are we working offshore? We have to think about the frequency of the source. So I talked before about how frequency is very related to resolution. So we need to think about the size of our targets, um, the depth of our targets, and make sure that our sources have the right frequency bandwidth by the time they get to that area of interest in the subsurface. We also have to think about signal to noise considerations. So thinking about, um, like, are we looking at something that will have a really big uh, reflection coefficient? So are we trying to image salt domes, <laughs> perhaps? Those have a very big reflection coefficient, usually compared to the sediments around them. Um, if, we, if we do, we may have a little bit more tolerance of noise, or if we're looking for something that might be more subtle, we may need to plan our acquisition to reduce as much noise as possible. We often have environmental constraints, environmental considerations. So besides those on land, you can also have them offshore in terms of um, uh, like the, the animals, <laughs> the, the whales. We often have to be very considerate of them, have uh, folks on our seismic ships that monitor and keep an eye out uh, for, for whales and, and other sea creatures. <laughs> um, cost and availability is something else we have to keep in mind. Um, in terms of what our budget is, whether the ships or the uh, geophones, hydrophones are available at the time we need them. And then we also have to think about the different seasonal conditions. So for instance, in Northern Canada, uh, you may want to do winter acquisitions so that you can get access to the area over the frozen ground. In the Gulf of Mexico, where I've shot surveys before, we had to be careful about hurricane season um, and also monitoring the eddies that exists so the big large scale circulation patterns in the Gulf of Mexico, because the eddies would kind of tend to move our streamers in, in directions that we didn't necessarily want them to go. Receivers also vary by environment. Um, so on land, we often use those geophones that can detect the ground motion. And so you could have one component or three component geophones. Um, at sea, we use the hydrophones in the streamers, like I've mentioned, and this is an example of some from a seismic acquisition I did about a decade ago. 
We also have ocean bottom cables, so OBCs, or ocean bottom seismometers, OBSs, and both of these are laid down on the seafloor, the ocean bottom. Um, so each type has its advantages and limitations. So for instance, OBS systems provide excellent data quality, but can be very expensive to deploy and then also retrieve and get the data back from. One of the things we have to consider when we're collecting seismic data and choosing our sources and receivers is that we're not just recording the reflections we want, but we're also recording various types of noise. And so when we think about and plan our seismic acquisitions, we want to consider the different energy types um, to figure out what would be most proper for the features that we're trying to image in the subsurface. Okay, so now I'm going to talk a little bit about seismic data. It's when it's first acquired, it's acquired in what we call shot profiles. And so you can see in this illustration from Liner's textbook um, that each shot profile kind of represents the energy that's recorded at all receivers at a single source point. So on the left, we've got our shot one, the energy sent down, and then it bounces back up and it's recorded at all those geophones. And then in the second case, we have initiated shot two and the energy goes down and it's recorded at all those geophones. So typically the receivers all stay in place and what you're moving is where the shot point is located. So once you've collected all your data, as we get ready for processing, the data can be arranged and kind of binned and sorted in a lot of different ways. And so this flexibility is really great for processing and advanced analyses. So we can organize the data um, in terms of like a common shot, a common receiver. So all the data that's recorded by one receiver from a common midpoint in the Earth's surface or from a common offset where all the angles, the reflection angles are say 10 degrees. And so each type of these grouping and binnings of the data provide, allow us to get different insights into the subsurface structure and help us identify and remove unwanted noise or perhaps uh, get a little bit of information about the fluids in the subsurface. Survey planning is really critical for success. And so this is a great diagram that kind of just takes into uh, consideration and shows you some of the various factors that have to be considered. Um, these are things like the source and the receiver spacing, the orientation of the line. I'll show you some different examples in seismic later on. Um, as well as the coverage area. And so the goal when you go out and acquire seismic data is to try to optimize the sampling of the subsurface while also managing those practical considerations that you may have, like cost and accessibility. And so in seismic acquisition, I've mentioned noise a couple of times now, uh, we tend to encounter two main types of noise. We have random noise, and this can be from things like the wind, the traffic, and other environmental fa factors. We also have coherent noise, which tends to show more consistent patterns and comes from either shot-generated sources or other systematic sources. So from the shot-generated sources, these are things like the surface waves from the ground roll, from multiples where you have these repeated reflections and mode converted waves. Um, in terms of uh, other coherent noise, uh, in that one acquisition I did in Oklahoma a few years ago, um, we actually got this uh, noise from the power lines that were you know, 30 feet or so above where we were acquiring data. And so understanding these noises is really crucial um, because we have to use different strategies for the different types of noise during processing to remove it. And so one of the ways, the most common ways we try to remove noise is through stacking. And what stacking does is it takes multiple traces that contain roughly the same signal, so for the same kind of 1D line into the earth, um, and it sums them together. And the idea there is that if you have coherent patterns, like at the reflection points, um, those will sum together, whereas the noise itself will cancel itself out. And so you could see here in this picture, we've got 64 traces um, on the left-hand side. And if we look at just one of them in the middle for B, let me turn on my pointer again. So if we look at one of them, it looks very noisy. But if we sum together all 64 of these, we get a nice signal like this post stack one uh, located you know, on the, the right hand side of the slide. 
Um, another problem we often have is that in marine acquisition, we often record more data than we actually need for imaging. And so this can include refracted arrivals that travel along the interfaces uh, rather than being reflected from them. And so this is an illustration from Cox et al. in 2020 um, that shows that these refractions can actually provide additional information about shallow velocity structure. Um, but we need to be careful that we handle them correctly during processing in order to avoid any interference of the refraction signal with our reflection data. Um, and the same thing goes, we've also got a bunch of multiples <laughs> shown in the image on the top point, and that's something we want to be wary of too. And we work at removing during the processing step.